Welcome back from uh, lunch. I think we better get, get going. I don't know where our chairperson is, but if we want to keep on time and optimize the time in the lab, I'd like to get going with, uh, with my chat. Uh, first of all, thank you to, Rob and, uh, uh, to Rod and the Swedish Spine uh, uh, Institute for inviting me back. It's always been a pleasure coming back here, and it's, uh, it's just wonderful to see the audience and the uh, noted speakers that are here. Uh, in the spirit of disclosures, I do have a relationship with each one of those listed entities up there. And uh, you can see uh, Mazor Surgical up there. That is the company that does make the robot that I use. And I've been involved with that from day one uh, with the, the company. So you will be getting a bit of a biased approach from me. But I think it will complement all the stuff that uh, Pat had talked about earlier. What I'm hoping is by the end of this session, you'll understand the principles of robotic-assisted surgery. You'll be familiar with the current literature that's out there. Appreciate the importance of preoperative planning for spine surgery. I've been involved in this project now 15 years, and there's one super important lesson that I've learned. It's the value of preoperative planning. And again, Pat alluded to that a bit, but I'm going to repeat that over and over and over again. And then at the end, to really be able to discuss the benefits and limitations of, of what we're doing. As spine surgeons right now, we are in a privileged position. Uh, I have no doubt that we're going to see tremendous advances over the next 10 years in what we can do. And you're going to see stuff in image-guided surgery and stuff in computers and robotics and navigation. And all that technology at some point is going to cross. And we're going to be able to take the best of all that stuff and use that to our patient's benefit. <clears throat> Just a, a brief thing on minimally invasive surgery. Everybody and their sister calls themselves a minimally invasive surgeon. And they link it to a laser, to doing a perk screw, to doing some kind of less invasive procedure. But it's really not the device. It's not the appropriate way to, to think of this. What we really want to think of is a philosophy, a philosophy of targeting the pathological tissue, minimizing the collateral tissue damage, doing it in the least invasive way. So all these technologies, really, we just have to keep thinking, how are we going to apply it to the spine pathology with minimizing the collateral tissue damage? Now, as spine surgeons, we always want to be in control. That's, that's the issue. We don't want to be like this poor guy. We're in the middle of an operation. The wheels are falling off, and we know we're about to crash and we don't have a plan B or a plan C as to how to complete the operation. So these are the tools that we can use to be in control. And preoperative planning is one of those critical components of it. Robots. Robots are here to stay. Every aspect of life today has now become automated. Uh, we get to Seattle through the airport. Our luggage is all sorted out with robots. The phones that we all use are all made somewhere overseas with robotic different apparatus. In the operating room, we've been reluctant to really integrate this technology. Because along with always wanting to be in control, surgeons are essentially insecure and paranoid. We don't want to give up our jobs or our positions. But one thing we have to remember is the surgeon is still always in control. Anyone can screw in a screw, but the surgeon has to know which patient, where the screw goes, what dimensions of the screws, and how to manipulate the spine. And there's no artificial intelligence, no robot that can do that. So we shouldn't be intimidated by the robots, but what we should be doing is embracing them and figuring out how we can take advantage of them for our patient's benefit. Now, there are different types of robots that are out there. There's the passive robots, which is essentially what I'm going to be talking about today, which positions us in three-dimensional space. It says, this is where you want to start your screw. This is the trajectory that you're going in. There's also semi-active robots and soon active robots that are actually going to put screws in for you or do decompressions for you. So you'll be able to preoperatively plan on a CT scan or MRI scan. This is where I want things to happen, and the robot's going to actually physically do that for you. And then there's the robots that will mimic what the surgeon does. So the robot can sit remotely from the operating room table, can operate on a console, or can operate with some other device, whereas the robot is at the patient's bedside or the surgical table doing it. So all of these technologies are out there and are available to us. 
What we're going to talk about today is this parallel manipulator. It's a six a degree of freedom platform that moves in three-dimensional space, really just to position us. The magic is not the robot itself. If you look at it, the robot's just these six turnbuckles, two platforms, and a surgical arm that you can put your drill bit through. The magic is really in the registration, the preoperative planning, and execution with the operating room plan that you have. Now, how many here, if you were going to the airport and you overheard the pilot say, yeah, I, I think I've got 80 people on board, and yeah, there may be a storm up ahead, but I don't know, and yeah, I think I have enough fuel on board, and you hear that he did not do his pre-flight plan. How many would get on that airplane with him? Not a soul. So as spine surgeons, we've been sitting here for years, and we put up an x-ray, we say, yeah, we'll cut here, we'll do this, we'll move this, and then we go into the operating room, we start doing things, and it never really comes out the way we expected it to. So that's where the preoperative planning really comes into effect. Much like the pilot has his pre-flight plan, and he plugs it into his onboard computer, the onboard computer facilitates that plan, that's what we're doing here. We're doing our pre-surgical plan, we take it to the operating room, we plug it in, and the computer and the robot facilitate the plan that we have designed. So there's multiple different systems that are out there right now. There's three major systems that are, are um, two that are commercially available, one that's going to be available real soon. They all do essentially the same thing. They support open and percutaneous or MIS uh, type approaches. But the important thing is they allow the surgeon to do his preoperative planning and it gives the surgeon the intraoperative control by positioning you in three-dimensional space. So once again, this is just the device that we're talking about with the six turnbuckle arms and the two, four, uh, the two uh, end plates and then the sidearm on it. We've got various system components. We've got your preoperative planning software. You've got the C-arm adapter ring that helps you register. You've got your workstation and then the surgical accessories. The components themselves, you have to attach this to the patient somehow. So there's multiple different options. You can use a spinous process clamp, what we call the hover T-frame or a bed mount frame. And each one has its advantages or disadvantages depending on whether you're doing a percutaneous case, an open case, you're trying to do a lateral case, or a large deformity scoli case. But this is the workflow. This is where I really want to spend a little bit of time so you guys understand Again, emphasizing this preoperative planning issue. So you've got your pre-op CT scan on these patients. You put that onto your laptop computer. And essentially what I do Sunday afternoons after the Cowboys lose, I take all my, my pre-op plans, I sit there, and I start doing them for the rest of the week. And depending on the complexity of the case, it's either 10 minutes or sometimes 45 minutes to an hour. If it's a complex revision where I have to redrill screws or a complex deformity and I want to line up my screws, it takes me a while to plan it and get it all out. If it's a straightforward L4-5 spondylolisthesis, that takes three minutes to, to plan out. So first you outline the region of interest on that CT scan. And then you decide what you're going to do. Is it going to be pedicle screws? You can plan facet screws, translaminar screws. You can plan essentially any type of fixation with this. And then you've got this uh, computer graphic interface where the CT scan is visible to you. And you place the screws where you want them. One of the things that I pay particular attention to is the proximal facet joints. We want to make sure we're not violating those facet joints. Again, a minimally invasive philosophy, minimizing the collateral tissue damage. So you can position the screws appropriately without impinging on those facet joints. Once I've got all the levels, the screws in position, I can go level by level, multiple planes, and see exactly where that screw is going to be. Can you start the movie, please? So this is a video of, of one of the plannings that we were doing early on. We've got the axial view. We position the screws in place and I can move them proximally, distally. I can adjust the trajectory back and forth on the screws. I can then adjust the size of the screws as well. Make the screws longer, shorter, wider, narrower. Uh, we heard a little bit about uh, working in osteoporotic bone and putting cortical screws in. Here you can pick exactly where you want that screw to be. 
You can adjust it in the axial plane. You then adjust it in the sagittal plane. Again, taking into account where the facet joints are, making sure that you've got good bony purchase, uh, obviously making sure you're not impinging on the neurological structures, you're not violating the spinal canal, and then you can look at the trajectories. Now, I'm a big proponent of using fixed head monoaxial screws for the deformities. I think a lot of our colleagues are kidding themselves with the deformities and polyaxial screws. So I spend a lot of time lining up the screw heads perfectly so the rod just drops in. Here you can adjust the screw. I'm just tilting it a little bit more lateral because it's a little too close to the canal. And then I can go slice by slice on my CT scan on the axial. Do the same thing slice by slice on the sagittal plane. Look exactly where that screw is going to end up. And again, you see the facet joint is preserved there. The screw's got good purchase and good bone. And then I'll move to the coronal view here. We've got the right-sided screw coming through. And I do the same exercise with the coronal image. And you'll see that there. And this is the image that I really like. So you see the vertebral body. And as you're moving back, you see the canal come into view. You see the pedicles come into view. And this gives you that sort of bird's eye view right down the canal. So you right down the pedicle, I should say. So you can see exactly where your screws are going to end up with this. So once I have the preoperative plan, we get what we call the summary plan. And this is where you can really make a difference in terms of operating room efficiency. I print out this summary plan. We post it in the operating room. The scrub tech, the circulating nurse, the implant supplier, everybody knows exactly what implants I need for that case. And they're prepared ahead of time. The rod length we know, the size of the screws we know, the number of screws we know. So it's all prepared so there's no surprises. The preoperative plan is done and we're able to dial in our corrections. Then we go to the operating room and we start operating. So this is the procedure flow. We do have to set up the C-arm, calibrate that. That takes the technician about three minutes to do. It's not a big deal at all. We decide on which platform. Uh, I typically use the hover T-frame or the clamp for most of the work that I'm doing because it's revision and deformity work. The bed mount is very good for percutaneous type uh, two or three level cases. Once we mount, we then register. Registration is really where the magic is in all of this. And uh, Professor Moshe Shoam from uh, the Technion University in Israel, he, he's really the genius behind all of this and taking the pre-op CT scan and two images in the operating room, an AP and an oblique image, and they merge and you get this very accurate registration to less than one millimeter. And that's where the real key is to this type of technology. So you position your C-arm for an AP and an oblique image with the reference frame in place and you get a segmentation. The second important aspect of this process is that the registration is segmental, meaning the computer recognizes individual vertebral bodies pixel for pixel. So it recognizes L5, L4, L3. So if you are doing an interbody procedure ahead of time before the CT scan is done and you've distracted the L4-5 disc space or you've reduced the degenerative lysthesis up to 13 millimeters, the computer still recognizes L4 was here on the CT, L5 was here on the CT, but now it's here. It understands that because it's looking for the individual vertebral bodies. So once you've got the segmentation, you then label it. You have to tell the computer, this is L4, this is L5, because remember, you're the surgeon, you're in control. So you label it, and then you get this dashboard confirmation. And this is really your accuracy. And you can see the speedometer dial on there that tells us just how accurate the registration is within one millimeter. Most of the time, it's 0 0.5 millimeters of accuracy. So and just to emphasize, the difference between this type of technology and what we have with navigation is navigation is a global registration, whereas this is a segmental registration. And here you can see it recognizes each individual vertebral body. And then you go ahead and you operate. And it's simply pushing the button, uh, telling uh, the technician, let's put in the left L3 screw. You push the button, and then the robot moves to that area. 
on the graphic user interface, you will get the instructions. It will tell you exactly where to position the robot, what length drill, what length tools you need to use. Uh, can you hit the video there, please? So here's just a, a video of the robot being set up. It's uh, placed in a plastic sleeve. It's then mounted onto the hover T frame, and the hover T frame slides up and down. Then you decide which screw you're going to be using, and the robot just moves in three-dimensional space to the position. And then through the arm, you place your guide tube. This was a perk case that we were doing. You tap down. Then you place your drill tube down through it, and then you drill. Getting back to the planning, the important thing here is to make sure you've got a nice flat area where you can dock that drill tube so you don't skive off so your drilling stays right down exactly where you want it to be. And then you do that and you repeat it for multiple different levels. So you insert your cannula, your blunt obturator, you drill, you tap, you place your K-wire, and you can essentially use any of the implant systems that are available on the market, and you repeat it for all your trajectories. Can you run this, uh, this video as well, please? So this is a video just looking at the robot moving, and it, it's actually like watching paint dry. It, you just sort of watch it shift from one to the other to the other, so it's really not as exciting as it seems. It's not this big whirring thing with the sparks. But uh, here's an example. This was a young girl, a 14-year-old with this idiopathic curve falling off to the side. You can see she's off-balanced coronally, which was really a big issue for her. And here's the preoperative planning. And this, again, is where I think control and preop planning is important. You can see her pedicle in that uh, top left picture. Her right pedicle is just a wafer. You can imagine what a nightmare that would be trying to do that freehand, even trying to do that with fluoroscopy. This is where I absolutely think you need some kind of navigation to ensure you get good purchase into the bone. So I can preoperatively plan exactly where I want that screw, that anchorage mechanism. And by no means is this a minimally invasive case. You can see we've got everything in there, and you can see where all those drill tubes are right now. But once I have the screws in, once I have the rods in, everything just lines right up. And here she is after. We've got all the screws in place. We've lined her up. We've balanced her in the sagittal and coronal planes. So it's just a way to keep the control of it. Uh, can you run this uh, video as well, please? So we did a couple of studies looking at the verification and the accuracy. And this is just one where we took the pre-op CT scan and then we did a post-op CT scan and we manually measured on that what the overlay was and what the um, error was. And you can see all the screws are essentially within a half a millimeter of where they were originally planned. So the screws end up exactly where they need to be. And if you look at it in the sagittal, the coronal plane, we get them right on most of the time. So in the literature, there's a number of papers that have been published now. This was a paper that we had done when um, I was still at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. We were looking at screw placement accuracy. And we had medical students, residents, fellows, attending surgeons, and the designers that were involved in this project on a cadaver study look at various parameters, including radiation exposure. Well, there's no doubt radiation exposure, that was a no-brainer. Um, it was far, far less. But one of the things that was very interesting with this study and, and kind of took a little bit of a blow to my ego was that the medical student was able to put in the screws as well as I was able to put in the screws because they did the preoperative plan, they understood it, so the technical details of this is really pretty simple. So if you can turn a screwdriver, you can really do this. If you understand the anatomy on the CT scan, you can put these screws in. So there really is not a substantial learning curve when you get it. This was a study by Candlehart out of Germany where he looked at 57 freehand cases, 55 robotic cases, and he concluded that in the robotic-assisted cases, the rate of misplaced screws and the duration of intraoperative x-rays were significantly lower, while the procedure times did not really differ. So the surgery is not any longer when you're using 
some of these navigation or robotic type devices. This was DeVito's paper looking at 840 cases in 14 hospitals, 3,000, over 3,000 pedicle screws, of which almost half were perk screws. 98% of the screws were clinically acceptable. Okay, let's go. There we go. And uh, he felt that this really helped increasing placement accuracy and reducing the neurological risks. Uh, when I'd moved to Dallas, we started looking at all our cases in a prospective fashion. We've uh, published a couple papers now. So this was sort of looking at our first 102, and we were trying to look at the, the lessons learned as we were going through this. So this was a consecutive series of cases, and these were all deformities and revision cases, essentially. And I had the research staff look at it. I wasn't involved in any of the auditing or any of the analysis of this. And then we, we sort of categorized the screws as successfully and accurately placed, malpositioned. We had to abort because we had some kind of issue with the, the robot or the screw, or I elected to not place the screw. And these were the demographics, but we were able, out of the first 102 patients, we were able to use the robot in 95 of them successfully. And we planned 1,085 screws, but 960 of those screws were ultimately placed. 949 were accurately placed, were placed exactly where I'd hoped. And 11 of those, 1.1%, were malpositioned. And I'll show you what happened to those malpositioned screws. And then we had 110 that were converted to manual placement, and that was in seven patients, and I'll show you what happened in that. But the consistent message here is overall was 1% malposition rate. And we also broke it down into the first 300 screws, the second 300 screws, the third 300 screws, and it really worked out to essentially the same thing. So we're keeping that malposition rate really low. And if you look at the literature, the rates for deformity and for revision cases is anywhere between 5 and 15%. So I can say with some element of confidence that we are doing better now than we were in the past with those. These were, oh, let me just go back to that one. So 10 of the screws uh, that were malpositioned were recognized immediately in the operating room. And essentially what was happening, the screws were not seated or the drill tube was not seated well enough on a flat surface and skived off. And that's what you have to really make sure is you've got a good flat surface. One screw we didn't appreciate, and I did have to bring her back to the operating room to remove that screw because it did cause some nerve irritation. These were the seven cases where I just couldn't do it clinically. And you can see one was a, a, a huge individual, six foot eight, 400 plus pounds. Um, he had a Schurman's kyphosis. I thought he would be ideal, but we just could not get good intraoperative x-rays. Another one was a very osteoporotic patient, could not get good intraop x-rays. Another one was a severe deformity. She had an over 100 degree deformity and the x-ray and the computer could not distinguish T4 from L4 because it was overlapping. So these are the things that we've learned over time and we've, we've got some strategies now to avoid that. But then again, we looked at all of this and tried to recategorize these in terms of accuracy and deformity and revision and we still found the same thing. Regardless, the screw accuracy rate is staying the same. So we think it's good. It is working. Less than 1% of them are malpositioned. Uh, but if you look at the literature, there's a 4.2 to 15.7% rate of malpositioned screws. So it seems to be an improvement. What's critical is the intraoperative fluoro registration and tool skiving was that lesson learned there. So we also wanted to look at, am I doing better over time? with this. Now we've got more, so we just kept adding cases, adding cases, and re-looking at it. And This was sort of the next cohort of patients that we went through, and again, we divided them up into 350-odd screws into the five groups. This was the demographics, and essentially it's exactly what you would expect. But if you look at this, the rate of screws successfully placed with the robot is pretty much the same. The screws converted to manual placement has dropped down dramatically because I'm planning better and I'm learning which are the patients I can really do this on. And the important thing is screw malposition is essentially negligible at this point. We, we've gotten down to a steady state. Now, will there be a screw malposition? Yes, obviously. Nothing is ever perfect, but we've gotten much better with it. So we are able to advance, be more efficient and more accurate in the operating room with this. 
If you look at the breakdown, it's probably going to take about 30 cases to reach that steady state where you understand which are the cases that you should be using it on, which are the planning issues that you need to take into account for this. Now, we've heard a little bit about pelvic fixation this morning in the S2 Ehler screws, and I've been a big proponent of these, and we also looked at some of ours. Um, we looked at 35 uh, sacral iliac screws that were reviewed in 18 of the patients, and again, took the pre-op CT scan and looked at the post-op, uh, or the pre-op plan and the post-op CT scan, and you can see that the deviations were entirely well within the errors of it. The starting point was about three millimeters off on some of them. The trajectory was about uh, 1.2 to 1.1 off in that lateral plane on average. Uh, in the ilium and S2 ailer, you've got a little more leeway with it. And one of the things that I think does happen is when I hook up the rods, you may be plowing that screw a little bit, so you're getting a little bit of deviation through that. But overall, we're still well, well within what I would say is an adequate accuracy rate for these types of screws. So I just want to show you a couple quick cases. This was a 59-year-old ank spawn patient who presented with some back discomfort. Someone did a laminectomy on him. And curiously enough, he had one mobile disc space, the L4-5 uh, disc space. But everything else was pretty much solidly fused. But you can see he was off sagittally. He was really uncomfortable. He was looking down at his toes all the time. Uh, this was my preoperative plan for him. And you can see screws all the way up and down. Um, and here's the planning for the S2 Ehler screws uh, that we put in to him and locked them in place. And, and there you can see the construct. And this was combined with a pedicle subtraction osteotomy as well. So we've got him nicely lined up. Uh, you can see the proximal end of those rods. I sort of cheated. I left them a little long thinking I may have to come back and do a cervical osteotomy on him because I didn't think I'd get enough correction there. But he was really happy. You can see the horizon. He's balanced now. So he's just gone with it. And he's about four years out at this point with that. This is another fem uh, patient, a case example. This is a 52-year-old female with an osteolytic collapse presented to my clinic with new onset back pain. Unbeknownst to her, she had lung cancer. This was her first manifestation of it. So again, here is a way that we can take advantage of less invasive techniques. And what we are now doing is percutaneously augmenting these and instrumenting them and then using spinal radio surgery as opposed to a thoracotomy, corpectomy, big reconstruction for these things. So here was the preoperative plan. Here was intraoperatively where we've got the tubes in, uh, the screws in place, and we can do our intraoperative vertebral augmentation for that, uh, limited decompression, make sure the canal is clear. And here she is post-op, and she did well for about three years, but eventually succumbed to her, her disease after that. But she came in to clinic on day one. I had her in the OR by day three. She was out of hospital by day six and got on with her life as a teacher and did everything she needed to do and, and wanted to do. This is sort of my bread and butter. This is my hallmark now. 60% uh, of my cases are now are revision uh, cases that get sent to me. This guy had eight, nine, ten. I can't even remember previous surgeries. You can see screws left behind. Um, uh, all the other screws are loose. Here's a CT scan. Uh, multiple previous surgeries. Just the, the typical complex revision where we're going to have to re-drill holes, find good bone, do osteotomies for him. So this is where you can actually preoperatively plan your osteotomies with this type of technology. And what I do is I'll place some K-wires down. We've got uh, osteotomes that are cannulated, or I use the ultrasonic bone scalpel now, and I have my K-wires in place and just slide down those K-wires to really facilitate the osteotomy. So as opposed to measuring with a micrometer and cutting with a chainsaw, I can now be much more accurate with things. And here's the final result. We've got the pedicle subtraction osteotomy done. We've got him laid back. We've got him all lined up and aligned and again uh, balanced over top of that, taking into account uh, the previous screw holes that I can drill around and, and find good fixation. And here you can see the progression of the S2 Ehler iliac screws coming across there. So one last thing I just wanted to talk about is radiation exposure. Uh, this is a big issue. I don't know how many are taking care of themselves. Uh, just remember, as surgeons, nobody cares about us. So you've got to start taking care of yourself and minimizing the radiation exposure. So how many wear lead aprons? 
when you're using. Good. How many are wearing lead-lined glasses? Two. Three. Okay. Wear glasses. A cataracts is a huge, huge issue. But really, the answer is limiting the radiation exposure. Now, this was a paper out of uh, Hartford, Connecticut, looking, and this was adolescent idiopathic scolies, but it, it was absolutely revealing to me when I saw this paper. First, I heard it at a meeting, and then it finally got published. But they looked at the radiation exposure to their patients in the episode of care, the entire care for their adolescent scoli care. And they divided into the observation, the bracing, and the surgery group. And you can see the observation group, not too bad. Total radiation exposure, 1,275 millirads. The bracing group, 2,193 millirads. But the surgery group had 17,700 millirads of radiation exposure. These are kids. These are young kids with developing organs. The maximum yearly exposure should be less than 5,000 millirems per year. So here, these kids have been getting three times the maximum dose. And 78% of that radiation exposure was in the operating room. You put in a pedicle screw, you turn it two turns, you take an x-ray. You turn it two turns, you take an x-ray. That's really where we have to limit it. So the types of technology that we see, whether it's navigation, whether it's robotics, those are going to help protect us as surgeons, help keep us in control, and help our patients and the rest of the operating room staff to minimize that radiation exposure. So please take that uh, as, as an important message from this. So what are the advantages? Well, we minimize intraoperative radiation. We are improving screw placement, precision, screw pullout resistance, and deformity correction. The preoperative planning, you've heard me say that a few times now, the preoperative plan is critically important. Uh, Pat also alluded to this. When I see this ahead of time, I walk into the operating room, I look at that anatomy, I recognize it immediately. I've been there before. I've seen it all. It just makes the surgery flow that much better. This does facilitate less invasive exposures, and it does enhance operative efficiency. But one thing I do like to emphasize is that robotic assistance is not going to make a bad surgeon good. You still have to understand the anatomy. You still have to understand the indications. You still have to pay attention to proper fusion techniques, decortication, providing the osteogenic, osteoinductive, osteoconductive material. What robotics does is it makes a good surgeon that much better. So the lessons that I've learned are the preoperative planning, the importance of that, uh, limiting the radiation exposure, the magic of this technology, and the future potential. There's no doubt in my mind that we're going to combine all these synergistic technologies and come out with something that's even better than what we see today. What we're doing today, 10 years ago, was science fiction. I know what we're going to be doing in 10 years and look back at what we're doing today, we're going to consider it barbaric. So we are going to get better and we are going to have these different automated type things. And I'll leave you with one last uh, statement here. Life is not a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather skid in, broadside, thoroughly used up and totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. This has been a tremendous ride. It's really been revealing for me over my career to see where we went from. When I started with this, I thought this was just a bad video game. We were playing with all these computers and robotics, and we were drilling screws right through the middle of spinal cords, in, in cadavers, of course. Um, and I, for five years, I thought, this is never, ever going to work. But all of a sudden, the technology just came to bear, and things worked out really, really well for us. <laughs>